Welcome to Anti-Tank Chats. In this series, we will take you through the history of infantry anti-tank weapons. In this episode, we'll be examining the last of our anti-tank rifles housed in the collection, the British Boys Anti-Tank Rifle. Please remember to like, subscribe, or click the little notification bell if you don't want to miss out on these videos. And I'd just like to say thank you to all our patrons for making this possible. Please join them if you can. Now, if you've read some of the early war training, British training manuals, on infantry anti-tank fighting methods or seen the 1942 Disney Canadian training film, Stop That Tank, you might come away thinking that the infantry had the upper hand in tank battles, with bold statements such as, tank hunting must be regarded as a sport, big game hunting at its best, a thrilling albeit a dangerous sport, which if skillfully played is about as hazardous as shooting tiger on foot. From this viewpoint, tank arm was described as having a hard skin, like a rhino, and that it could be effectively engaged if the infantryman was suitably equipped with a big game hunting gun, such as the boys. Whilst there was some British development of an anti-tank rifle during the Great War, Major Philip Godsell's design was a single shot bolt action rifle using a new 0.600, 0.500 cartridge. The lack of a significant German tank threat meant that there was less of an urgent need to pursue the development of such a weapon. It pretty much stays this way until 1934, when under the leadership of Captain H.C. Boys, the next stage in British anti-tank rifle development begins at the Royal Small Arms Factory, Enfield. Based on the US .50 caliber MG round, and originally codenamed Stanchion, the design was accepted into the British Army service in November 1937 and renamed the Boys Anti-Tank Rifle, as a tribute to Captain Boys, who died only a few days earlier. The original specification was for an anti-tank rifle to penetrate 16 mm of armour at 100 yards, with the SA armour-piercing 0.55 inch W Mark I round. As we've seen in an earlier episode, this was less performance than the T-Giver had offered almost 20 years earlier. A new Mark II round was developed in 1939, offering better penetration with a lighter bullet and propellant charge, as we can see here, which made the Mark I obsolete. A further design in 1942 offered more penetration, being based around a tungsten cord, armour-piercing, composite, rigid round. But new developments in anti-tank warfare, particularly in shoulder-launched shape-charged weapons, were starting to enter production. Focusing on the weapon itself, the boys' anti-tank rifle is 162.5 centimetres long and weighs 13.3 kilograms, around about 36 pounds, making it around about a kilogram heavier than the German Panzer Buter 39. At the end of the barrel, we have the round recoil reducer, a muzzle brake, <laughs> along with a strong buffer spring at the rear and a shoulder piece to help reduce the weapon's recoil. Ammunition is provided by a five round magazine loaded front first into the body. The 1942 training pamphlet suggests that a halfpenny be used to act as a magazine platform depressor as an improvisation, which suggests that there were some magazine loading issues that had been encountered. Sighting is provided by a front sight and a rear sight with off, which is offset to the left. The back sight can be set to 300 yards or 500 yards by turning a lever left or right. The rifle was supported at the front by a T-shaped monopod, which is unfortunately missing from our example. The boys' anti-tank rifle was distributed four to an infantry platoon, with one deployed to each section. Although intended for armour targets, the boys was not seen as a specialist weapon, and the training pamphlets emphasised that all ranks should be capable of handling them with a small amount of instruction, as it had similarities to existing weapons they had trained on. The Tank Museum is a registered charity and every purchase you make from our online shop directly supports our work. We ship worldwide and if you subscribe to our email list, we'll give you 10% off your next order. When you finish this video, go to tankmuseumshop.org and you'll find something you never knew you needed. In terms of penetration, Whilst the boys could penetrate only 10% less armour at 300 yards than it could at 100 yards, if the angle of impact increased, this would increase rapidly, with half the penetration at 300 yards if the angle was 40 degrees or above. 
1942 training pamphlet stated that, as a general rule, the 0.55 inch anti-tank rifle bullet will penetrate all parts of the Panzer I and the sides and rear of the Panzer II at 250 yards. Fire at larger tanks such as the Panzer III, gonna should, if it is possible, be aimed at vulnerable points such as the turret ring to cause burring over surfaces and thus produce jamming. Unfortunately, for the boys' rifle operator, these tanks were themselves obsolete or had received up armoury, so were even harder to successfully engage. However, the 1942 pamphlet was more expansive than the 1937 one, which had basically recommended that aim was taken at the driver and the gunner, interestingly not at the commander, and not at the vehicle's vital parts. Data for penetration for anti-material targets such as brick walls and sandbags was also provided, with the 0.55 inch round being able to penetrate 14 inches, around about 35.5 centimetres of brick, and 10 inches, about 25 centimetres of shingle sandbags. The training emphasised the importance of sighting the boys to increase the chance of obtaining a side or rear shot, as well as maintaining surprise by good concealment. It was recognised that this was compromised once firing commenced as the boys had a pronounced flash and muzzle blast and was difficult to swing across a wide arc when fired in the prone position. Valuable practice for the soldier was to be undertaken on the miniature range by using 0.22 inch attachment. Although operated by one man carrying it other than short distances was of best achieved with two men, one carrying the rifle and the other assisting with eight boxes of ammunition. An additional 160 rounds of ammunition in bandoliers were carried on supporting vehicles for each boy's rifle. Although a British design, the Boys Anti-Tank Rifles Combat Debut was actually with Finnish forces during the Winter War of 1939-1940. In addition to its use in infantry units, for instance, a 1940 British infantry division would have 361 Boys Anti-Tank Rifles, the Boys Rifle was also mounted on universal carriers and armoured cars such as the Morris a 1924 pattern Rolls-Royce. Accounts of the boys' ineffectiveness increased as heavier tanks arrived on the battlefield, and they really only sought success against light armour such as Panzer I's and II's, the Italian L3 tankette and M1139 medium tanks in North Africa. In Steve Zaloga's anti-tank rifle book, he mentions one account in North Africa which stated that the boys was given to the company drunk as penance and pointed the fact that the 8th Army could find no evidence of the Boyd's rifle enjoying success against German tanks during Operation Crusader in autumn 1941. In total, 68,847 Boyd's anti-tank rifles were manufactured in the UK by August 1943, with a further 45,234 rifles in Canada by December 1943. 3,200 boys rifles were sent to the Soviet Union and a further 700 to the United States. The Canadians persevered with the boys a little past its obsolete stage, introducing a Mark I Star boys with a harmonica rather than a round muzzle brake. Plans in 1943 were also afoot to manufacture a Mark II boys rifle for airborne forces, which was shorter and lighter. The inadequacies, together with new designs such as the Piat, had clearly superseded them, as had happened with the German anti-tank rifle. The boys would end up with the home guard, unloved and unused. If you enjoyed this episode of Anti-Tank Chats, the next episode will look at the arrival on the battlefield of the Sake Charge, and in particular, the American position.